Ever tried reading while jogging, cooking, or even juggling flaming torches? Yeah, doesn't end well. But with Audiobooks.com, you can conquer books without the circus act. Dive into over 450,000 titles, including more than 10,000 free ones. Get hooked on a bestseller, find your next obsession, or finally read that classic you've been avoiding since high school. And here's the inside scoop. Sign up today for a free 30-day trial and snag your first three audiobooks on the house. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E. Hey, it's Storyworthy. Today on the show, storyteller Erica Bloomfield talks about waitressing in New York. There had been this man, kind of like a wiry professor looking type, who had been sitting at a table for hours and all he had had was a bowl of $4 soup. And I had brought him extra bread, which was breaking the rules and he still hadn't paid. So I, I approached him politely and I asked him like, oh, we really need this table. Could you please pay? And he did not like this. He like stood up, he got very aggressive and he was shouting, you know, um, you better not be expecting a tip and how dare you? And I just snapped and I was like, that's it. And I stormed across the cafe and I slammed the door open and I said, just get out of here. We don't want your money. He walked across the restaurant and he stops, turned, and he started to choke me. Today on the show, storyteller Erica Bloomfield talks about waitressing in New York. Stay close. Hey, it's Erica Bloomfield, and you're listening to Story Worthy. Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from Los Angeles, California. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or 14 years, or you're a brand new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. I hope you guys enjoyed the story last week with storyteller Jen Curcio. Erica, you know Jen. I do. Yeah, well, Jen told a story last week about she almost got married on a second date. Do you happen to know that story? I love that story. I love all Jen's stories, but that one is, yes, very. Jen Curcio, she's so talented. She's so funny. She's smart and very subtle. And she talks about going to see the eclipse, not the, not the eclipse that just passed, but the one in 2017 with a date. It was just the second date. And it was so magical. They almost got married. But I mean, they would have gotten married. They walked to a church. They went to a church. So anyway, go back, you guys. Listen to Jen Curcio. She's such a funny person and just a great story. But not today, you guys. Stick with me now because today I'm here with another fabulous storyteller. Her name is Erica Blumfield. You hear her talking. And Erica brings forth the topic today, waitressing in New York. I can't wait to hear this story. I have waitressed, Erica, I don't know if you knew this, but I've waitressed in 18 restaurants. Wow. I know. I waitressed like in Mexican restaurants, French, German, Italian. <laughs> I, <laughs> I even worked in an Asian restaurant, which is absurd because everybody else was Asian. And I'm like, you know, it's just I didn't fit. I did not fit at the Le Petit Cafe. I didn't fit. No, it was French. That was the French place. Yeah. Anyway. I think I've been to Le Petit Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one was in Pittsburgh. I mean, maybe it's a popular name. I love it. All yeah. right. So I'm really happy to have you here. And uh, when's the last time you waitressed, by the way? Oh, I have to confess this was in my 20s and I'm now in my 40s. No, 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 but that tracks. I mean, same with me. I was a waitress from the ages of 15. I lied. My first job, I said I was 16 to work at Grande Pizza in Pittsburgh. So from then until I became a flight attendant at 23, only in like those seven or eight years, I had 18, rest you know, I, I had that much experience waitressing in 18 different restaurants because they kind of, those jobs kind of come and go, don't they? 
Yeah, I waitressed actually at the restaurant we're going to hear about on and off for, oh my gosh, like almost 10 years. Yeah. And um, I had other shitty jobs, but this was not a shitty job. This place this is was a good one. We're going to hear about it. Yeah. Oh, good. Did you ever waitress at a place that pulls tips? Do you know what I mean? Yes. And can you explain pulling tips for me, just for the audience? Sure. It's when you have sections, but you still split all your tips or you don't even necessarily have sections. It could just be a free for all. But um, and then instead of keeping your own own tips from like, say you a table one through 10 and you work those 10 tables all night and you keep your own money, you have to just, everyone puts their tips in whatever they make that night. And then it's split evenly. And it's split amongst the waitress staff, but then the hostess gets a percentage or does somebody else get some money in there? Yeah, there's usually a tip out to like back of house. I, these are like old terms. I don't know if they're still. No, I understand. Yeah. Yeah. So like the the bus people and the bartender sometimes it depends. But I feel like that's pretty standard. Then you tip it, them out. Right. It's interesting because like if you do that pulling tip system and I know a lot of restaurants, especially here in L.A., they do do that. But do you just. Assume everybody's being fair. I have to be honest with you that when I was young and waitressing, I was super intense about it. And we pulled and it, I used to get like crazy because I felt like people weren't pulling their weight or whatever. Like I was not the pulling thing for me back then before I grew as a human being didn't work for me. But then as I've evolved as a human being, I actually think pulling can create like camaraderie and people caring to work together and not like a competitive or you get screwed over because the left side of the restaurant has better lighting and booths and everyone wants to sit there all night. And then the manager like so-and-so better than you and always gives them the section. There is so much politics in restaurants. I know. Right? I know. Restaurants are, you know, that's why there's television. That's why there's reality shows about them because it's full on drama yeah. all the time. But still, you didn't answer the question. Have oh. you <laughs> known anybody to withhold their tips or did you ever pull back? Oh, no, 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 no. Like steal. No, I didn't yeah. think people stole. I really huh. I really liked the people I worked with. I was thinking the other day that they would maybe be like, oh, she was so intense. And I was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, at but least I you can see that now you have clarity. That's that's nice. <laughs> I have remorse. I'm sorry if you knew me when I was a waitress. When you <laughs> What was the name of the restaurant? It's called Cafe Cento Sette. <laughs> All right, everybody out there from Cafe Cento Sette, Erica apologizes. But I do understand how that works in terms of pooling tips, because then the whole restaurant comes together as almost like a family and they open the doors and all these people come in. And the family has to work together to have a cohesive unit to make everybody come in, eat and move on and get out of there and then keep turning those tables until it culminates in the end of the night when things start winding down. And then somebody has that money. Who gets the, who has the money? The hostess who takes the tips to, to, do, to dole out? Oh, we would keep them in our aprons and... Keep it. And back then, because this was going back to like, what year was it? Like the, like the, when did I first start working at the cafe? 93, 90, like 1994 or yeah, ish. It was cash always. And we just have wads of our money and our aprons. And then at the end of the night, we sat down, we put it all together and counted it. You're kidding me. Like mobsters. Yeah. Just cash on the table. Cash on the table. That's hilarious. Yeah. Wow. What a sight that must have been. I never worked in that in that type of um, of a waitressing restaurant. I've, I've never pulled tips before. Yeah. You've been in L.A. for how long now? Um, Like almost 20 years. 
Yeah, a good amount of time. And you really, it seems like in the last 10 years, you've been really moving forward and you have your own storytelling show every month at a place called the Glendale Room in Glendale. And it is en fuego. That show, it's always packed. Everybody goes. I think one of the reasons is you really put together and you you curate a great show, Erica. Well, that means so much to me. I love it so much. Like I used to love as a like teenager and keep, like I used to love throwing parties and that's what mm-hmm. it feels like. And it's just a group of, you know, people coming together. And I love, it has like an artistic, open, loving, you know, vulnerable, but also you get laughs and there's, I just try and create, you know, a place where people feel like, yeah, I want to go there. And the Glendale room is such a beautiful venue. It's so chill. It always smells smells so good like potpourri <laughs> it's like yeah no it is it's a great space and they have like this honor system on beverages so you can go over just open up like a regular refrigerator and there'll be wine in there and beer and coolers and everything you could want and then you just take whatever you want and then beside it is basically a pile of money you put your money in there you got to do it or you venmo and i think everybody does just because it's so wildly crazy to do this system people just think like well it must be a trick so i better pay (laughs) the camera's on them yes (laughs) i know what you're saying though yes and i think that's the vibe that's there like it's communal let's come together let's celebrate people's truths and vulnerabilities and hilarities well it really is run very professionally you move it right along and then it's over so you you hit it, you quit it. Everybody hangs out, actually. You know you did a good show if people hang out. If people are hanging out, that means they liked it and they want to talk about it. If you do a show and everybody's gone at the end, that's because they didn't want to be there. <laughs> well, that's a relief. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you also ran a storytelling open mic here in Los Angeles at the Lyric Hyperion. And I think... I don't I'm not saying I'm not taking credit for it, but I think I did that a long time ago. Then you picked it up and it's just so original. A lot of people, you know, there's comedy open mics, but I have never even heard of a storytelling open mic until us. I owe you so much. You were like, I don't even, I want to rack my brain, but somehow I found out about your mic And that was when it was like early on for me. I had maybe done the moth once or twice. Someone must have told me at the moth or something. And and then I met. And when I say I did the moth once or twice, I have good luck there. I'm now I just it. But um, I'm so superstitious. It's insane. Wait, do you mean in terms of getting called? Yeah, yeah. But so it had been just like, you know, a couple of, uh, you know, months or something into it. And I met you and I met Kelly Spillman, the wonderful Mm -hmm. storyteller. Kelly's a great storyteller. She yeah. sure is. Yeah. But anyway, it's exciting that you've kind of immersed yourself into this world of storytelling because you're so damn good at it. You've played Story Smash a couple of times. I think you always win. Don't you pretty much always win? <laughs> I don't always win, but I love your show. It's like my favorite thing to do. It is Chris, if you've not been to or listened to the episodes of Story Smash, you must. It is side splitting. And I love the judges, Danny Zucker and Blaine and Melissa and Wendy. I mean, they're amazing. They're fantastic. And as a player, and I recommend you put your name in as the audience member because you get like, it's like such a natural high. I feel like I, yeah. I did like a really great drug when I play. Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. that I think drugs are good. Drugs are bad. Well, of course. Right. But it is funny. The audience member is either is a really good storyteller and they surprise everybody or it's somebody who's totally unprepared, has no idea what they're doing. And that's what happened on the last story smash. Remember that guy, Michael, got called. He didn't even know where he was. Talk about drugs. What was he on? <laughs> <laughs> no, he just he came out and he had a minute. 
And he starts off the minute by saying, my, my, I think he landed on birthdays. And he said, my best birthday was when I was 21. And I woke up and I was with three women in the bed. And it's like, holy shit. And everybody's just like, wow. And then after that sentence, he had nothing else to say for a minute. <laughs> it was hilarious. I was dying. It was so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Because really. also it was the kind of thing I was like, is this a bit? Because I was like, this could be a bit. Right. And yeah. I don't know. It was like the theater of the absurd. So you never know yeah. what you're going to get. It's story smash was so fun. Super fun. Well, I hope it goes someplace because I think that it would be very popular for, for everybody. You know, I think it would be just very popular on television or on Netflix. Oh, whatever. All right. Listen, Erica, you've also been on the Risk podcast and that ain't nothing. And you have a great website, ericabloomfield.com. Good looking website, Erica. Congratulations on that. Thank you, Mio. Yama Uchi made the website for me. She designed it. She's a terrific storyteller, too. Wow. No kidding. Well, it's a beautiful website. She did a great job. All right, you guys, before we get to Erica's story, I wanted to remind you to please take a listen to My Life in Three Songs. My Life in Three Songs is a podcast I've been doing for two years now, and it's exclusively on Spotify because I talk to comedians about the three songs in their life that have impacted them. Not their favorite songs, but songs that have really made a difference in their life that gives you a look at the comedian and where they grew up. Please, you guys, check it out. MyLifeIn3Songs.com. Tell your family. Tell your friends. Tell your enemies. My Life in Three Songs. It's incredibly entertaining, and it is really where my passion is right now. I mean, my passion's here with you, Erica. It's storyworthy. <laughs> but at night, I dream about my life in three songs. How's that? I love it. Music is the best. It is. It's it's everything. Yeah. Music is everything. And it really goes hand in hand with comedy, in, in my opinion. Anyway, you guys, both solo sports, as it were. You know what I mean? But, uh, you know, when you talk about music and comedy, you're talking about musicians and comedians, and it's a, it's like a solo sport. I mean, I guess even if you're in a band, you're sort of, that's a bad analogy. All right, forget all of that. Uh, anyway, I'm glad you listened to the show. Thank you so much. All right, you guys, wherever you are, put your hands together for the very talented Erica Blumfield. When I was a kid growing up in Philadelphia, all I dreamed about was being an actress on Broadway. So when I graduated high school, I immediately moved to New York City. I was given a piece of advice from a veteran New Yorker. They said, in New York City, be like an exclamation point, not like a question mark. I took this advice to heart and I set forth on my New York journey with confidence, excitement and without doubt. Now, one of the things that I had to do was find a job to support myself in one of the most expensive cities in the world. And I figured it was expected to be a waitress slash actress. The only problem was, is that I didn't have any job experience. So I made a fake resume and I went into restaurants with that confidence and prayed that no one checked my references. And soon I landed a job at an East Village restaurant. And it turns out that I was the worst waitress in the world and the manager did not hold back from telling me so every night he'd say you're so stupid 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 and I took it for a few weeks but finally this one night I just couldn't take it anymore and I quit and after I felt on top of the world and as I walked the East Village streets toward home. I was floating on air until it hit me. What had I done? I needed that job. I was lucky to have that job. And I started to panic. What am I going to do? And that's when I saw it. Cafe Cento Sete. 
it was a quaint little place, like the kind of place you'd find off the beaten path down a cobblestone road in Florence. It was had these uh, pic- it had these huge picture windows surrounded by twinkling little white lights. And I peeked inside and I saw just 20 or so small two top tables and this mahogany bar gorgeous and behind this bar stood this woman and she looked very regal and I felt much more like an insecure question mark than a secure exclamation point but my nerves propelled me forward and I approached her on the bar and I said excuse me um can I talk to the manager and she said I am the manager And I said, well, look, it all came pouring out of me. I my name is uh, and I said, look, my name is Erica. And honestly, I am the worst waitress in the world, but I'm a really hard worker. And I promise you, if you just give me a chance, I will be the best waitress. And she looked me up and down. She raised an eyebrow and then she said, Be back tomorrow, 10 a.m. Bring pens. And so I show up the next day and under her guidance, I truly did become the best waitress. I never forgot a face. I never forgot an order. I once got a highly intoxicated Liza Minnelli. You young folk out there know her from Louise Two and Arrested Development. Um, (laughs) She was very drunk on martinis and she was chain smoking in the restaurants, which was not allowed. And I got her to stop smoking. No easy feat. I could even sell the oldest slice of Italian cheesecake. I had great salesmanship. (laughs) And once the village voice wrote up the restaurant mentioning the best and friendliest waitress in the East Village, me. I lived up to my promise that day to the manager that I would be the best waitress. But after four years of working at the cafe, although I loved my cafe Centosete family, I was feeling disheartened and my bunions ached. I had been going out on auditions and with managers and agents and hearing you're too short, you're too tall, you're too fat, you're too thin, you're too ethnic, you're not ethnic enough, all kinds of rejection, rejection, rejection. And I felt as though I was pursuing an impossible dream. And on this one busy night, people were lining up out onto the street for a table at the cafe. And there had been this man, kind of like a wiry professor looking type who had been sitting at a table for hours. And all he had had was a bowl of $4 soup. And I had brought him extra bread, which was breaking the rules. And he still hadn't paid. So I I approached him politely and I asked him like, oh, we really need this table. Could you please pay? And he did not like this. He like stood up. He got very aggressive and he was shouting, you know, um, you better not be expecting a tip and how dare you. And I just snapped and I was like, that's it. And I stormed across the cafe and I slammed the door open and I said, just get out of here. We don't want your money. And he did. As I said, he walked across the restaurant and he exited. And I was standing in the doorway with my back to everyone in the restaurant. And he stops, turned, and he started to choke me. (gasps) Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And in that moment, I... Everything just was like in slow motion, the cars, the passerbys, there was a neon sign marquee for the variety arts theater. It was all blurring together. And then survival skills kicked in and I hauled off and I punched him in the gut 
And he like dropped his hands over my neck and he stumbled back and he just looked stunned and took off down Third Avenue. Oh my God. <laughs> so then, um, okay, so then, you know, everyone was like around me. Are you okay? Are you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine. I'm kind of in shock, but I was like, I need a minute. So I go out and I'm standing in front of the cafe and, I, and I'm and i just, I start crying and I'm like talking out loud to myself. Like, what am I going to do with my life? This is, you know, this is, this, this is what's going on. Like what is happening? And then I heard this little voice, excuse me. He heard again, excuse me. And I turn around and I see this little old lady and she's wearing a house dress and what may have been slippers. And she looks at me and she says, you must be an actress. And I looked at her and I kind of nodded and she said, I used to want to be a dancer. Oh, back in those days, there were these midnight booze cruises up and down the Hudson. I danced till my feet were dead. But then someone discouraged me and she looked at me intently and she said, don't let anyone discourage you. You hear me? And I nodded and then she walked away. And as she was walking away, I heard her continue. You hear me? Don't let anyone discourage you, especially the CIA. <laughs> Those motherfuckers. <laughs> and I stood there looking after her and I thought, <laughs> Okay, so she may have been a little crazy, but she was like my crazy angel who the universe had dropped down to remind me to keep on keeping on. And I lifted my head high, I wiped my tears, and I walked back into that cafe, which led me to my dreams coming true in many ways. And in others, not so much. <laughs> That's the button. Okay. Oh, my God. I cannot believe you got into a, a fight, an altercation at a restaurant. Mm -hmm. What was that guy doing? What he? In other words, you would open the door. He walks out. And now you're in. Are you in the doorway when he reaches to, 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 to choke you? Or are you out on the sidewalk? Yeah, it was like there's like a little stoop, like a one step stoop. Yeah. And I was standing on it and my door in the doorway. Sure. Like, but I was standing with like kind of within the doorway on the stoop. And he had like walked onto the sidewalk and then reached out. But my back was to the people in the restaurant because I had just I was like just kicked him out. I just cannot believe this man that he thought that was his only option to reach across and grab your neck. I don't know. I mean, like his thumbs in your Adam's apple. I mean, he, I don't think he had choked someone before. I don't think he was expert at it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean. In other words, it was just, what was he freaking doing? I mean, to be honest with you, I infuriate men with my power. I mean, it's kind of true. It's not the first time or the last time that someone tried to choke me of the male gender. Stop. It. I'm serious. Stop. No way. Did this man ever come back to that restaurant or that was? I believe not. I never. And you didn't take the day off? No, hell no. I, I'm i not like that. I was just like, OK. I also really, truly met this little old lady and I maybe I'm weird, but I was just like, that was wild. Well, it is wild. And she was so poignant until the CIA part. Yeah. But, you know, maybe the mentally ill are prophets. No, I'm just kidding. They'll take me away. No, I, 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 
I, I don't know. But what did the owner of that restaurant say to you? Did they say I can say that because I have mental illness. I wasn't making fun of people with mentally ill. I people understand that. And, okay. By the way, everybody has a little bit of mental illness. There's no doubt about mm. it. But yeah, but, yeah. but did the boss of the restaurant, that lady who had been like so stern at the beginning and all that, did that lady, was she there that day? Uh, I can't be sure. I'm just trying to figure out, did the restaurant give you like a commendation? Is that the word commendation? Did they give you like, oh, my God, Erica, you know, or did they call the police? No, no, it all happened very quickly. And yeah, it all happened very quickly. Like I was fine. I was just like, go back. It's hard to explain the cafe. This is interesting. I never analyzed it from that point of view, but it's very the cafe, the character of the cafe that it happened. And we just all went along with it. It's kind of like what you were talking about. It's a smooth machine, right? If I hadn't been able to pull it together, it would have been a wreck for everyone involved. Yeah. And I'm a trooper. And I was like, I got back into my, you know, I got back into that team, I guess. But it's just very the cafe. Oh, it happens. There's just no place like New York. I think it's also a New York thing. <laughs> yeah, that's true. For somebody to even come into the place and to camp out, not leave. That's a New York thing. I mean, maybe that's everywhere, but it seems like New York people just, you know, because where are they going to be in their horrible apartments? No, they're going to be out. Back then it was like, yeah, back then it was just Starbucks had just started. Yeah. Like, I mean, this was a long time ago. People, yeah, would just sit, yeah, because they you know, it. take now it's common. Now it's common with the, with Wi-Fi and the, you know, internet and laptops. But like back then, yeah, people would just hunker down in cafes. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Maybe. <laughs> no, I know <laughs> what you're saying because they'd be there yeah. for two or three or four hours and they still only give you five bucks. And now they've used that table that should have been turned five times. Right. It was more of like a bigger city thing, I think, is what I'm saying. And now, the, yeah. yeah, like sitting in cafes and working is. I know what yeah. you mean. And also just the fact that he took off running like people are just anonymous. <laughs> New York is hilarious. It's just a character. Yeah, it is. It's a character. New York, the city is a character. Yeah, that's funny. I never I never yeah. thought of it like that. Waitressing is hard work. Am I right? I want to turn the cafe into a sitcom because there were so many cool, like when I think back on the years that I worked there, I feel so grateful. I mean, I met Valerie Harper was one of the nicest people I've ever mm. known. Celebrities, you nice. know, Rhoda. Yeah. And I loved her from, from reruns. Sure. And sure. she used to, there was a theater called the Variety Arts Theater. I'm getting emotional. I'm so ridiculous. <laughs> the nostalgia. But there was a, a Variety Arts Theater and it was an off-Broadway theater. And so she was starring in a one-act play by Elaine May. You know, yeah, wow. yeah. Sure. From Nichols and May. Yeah. yeah. And she was hilarious. It was, a yes, it was a hilarious one act. And it was like a solo thing where she was on the phone. And I, I think, I think she was like with the suicide operator, but she's like, but yeah. It, oh, that's funny. I think that's what it was, but she's like, but it's, it's tragic, but hilarious. And it's very, that quick right. pace may, and, she, and it's just sure. Valerie on the phone the whole time. And she was amazing. amazing. I still remember how, what she used to order. She used to order chicken Francesca. It was like, a, but she'd ask for like the sauce on the side. It was a battered chicken with a butter, like lemon sauce. Oh, that's so neat. To remember. <laughs> Sorry, I that's love hilarious. her. Hilarious. No, it's really sweet. It's really neat. And also New York, it has that that feeling of anything could happen. Nobody has a car. So everybody's kind of walking and which way are you headed? And oh, I'll walk with you. And and so it's very much like a pedestrian city as well, which which I think adds to commu community, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of communal stuff going on there. Yeah. And then it's almost like us and them because then all the tourists come in. But that's separate. That's a different group of people. I'm not good at going to New York anymore. 
Mm, I get right? I get like body checked. I'm so LA now, like my my vibe and my mellowness. Like I always know people are like so annoyed because I'm not getting like my debit card out fast enough at the <laughs> deli or bodegas or you know. Yeah. And that's so funny. I'm just like, oh my God, I've turned into such an LA lady. But I'll never forget my times in New York. That's nice. Well, also New York, you know, yeah, the pace is fast and it's true. L.A. is much more laid back. Yeah, that's for sure. I'll tell you when New York is great. New York is great with money. If you go to New York with money, holy cow, is it a great experience. And I've done that twice with my kid. I took my kid two years in a row, and I'm going to do it again this fall, to New York. And both times we stayed three nights and four days, and both times we saw four shows each time. And I know, a lot of money. I put it all on the credit card. I still haven't paid off the first trip, let alone the second trip. We could all not be here tomorrow, so I say. That's just it. That's just it. In 50 yeah. years, we're all dead. You know, what's the difference? Things are not looking good. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, no, but it, even if things are looking good, still, life is short. So, That's I mean, true. I'm going to pay it off. I'm going to pay it off. It's just my kid's only young now. And, <laughs> and I can only force them to do things with me now. Because as soon as they're 18 next year and they're off on their own, then it's like they have choices, for God's sakes. Now my thumb is still right on them. Crushing. No. <laughs> well, you're a good mom. That's lovely. That's fun. Yes. My mom used to take me. Part of the reason why I loved Broadway was my mom always would take me into the city at least like a couple times a year because Philly's close to New York City, you know. Like, sure, you can yeah. just take the train into Penn Station. Yeah, we'd just take the train and she'd take me to see a Broadway show. I I remember like I saw Gregory Hines and Tap Dance Kid and I saw a Chorus Line. I mean, you know. That's we, amazing. Like, yeah, she took Annie. Yeah, it was like one of my favorite things to do as a kid. Yeah, great memories. And, yeah. you know, as a parent, I'm trying to cement them. Yes. All right, Erica Bloomfield, I am so happy to talk with you. You're always such a treat and you're very talented. You know that. You know that. <laughs> well, thank you again so much for coming on the show. You guys don't forget Erica Blumfield dot com. It's just that simple. That'll take you to everything Erica. All right, you guys, thank you again so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Head over to storyworthypodcast.com and join my mailing list. I only send out a letter about once a month, so it's not too irritating. Again, storyworthypodcast.com. And please check out my Life in Three Songs. My Life in Three Songs is a project I'm very passionate about, and I really hope I can get my storyworthy audience over there. So please check it out. Spotify is free. Download the app, and then you are listening to my life in three songs all right you guys thanks again for tuning in one more time on behalf of the very talented eric blumfield thank you thank you so much christine my name is christine blackburn saying make it a story worthy week Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Okay, so why do people love my Total Body Bar workouts? Because they work. My clients get an amazing workout and great results. I'm Andrea Rogers, professional dancer and trainer, and my Extend Bar classes are fun. Only 30 minutes and proven to help you get sculpted, lean, and strong. And right now, you can stream my Extend Bar classes for free on the Beachbody On Demand app. See how effective these workouts truly are. Start for free today at Beachbody.com. The drive to go further and reach higher. 
the same thing that inspires you inspires us. At Strayer University, we're always searching for new ways to make education more affordable. That's why we offer access to up to 10 no-cost gen ed courses to help you save time and money so you can keep striving. Visit Strayer.edu to learn more. No-cost gen ed provided by Strayer University affiliates of your learning. Eligibility rules apply. Connect with us for details. Strayer University is certified to operate in Virginia by Chef. You love podcasts. The stories, the laughs, the unexpected turns. But when this episode ends, the silence starts. Not anymore. Audiobooks.com turns that silence into your next great adventure. With over 450,000 titles, from bestsellers to hidden gems, your love for listening just found its new best friend. And because you already know the joy of audio, we're giving you three free audiobooks to start your journey. Imagine your favorite podcast, now with unlimited episodes. That's audiobooks.com. Keep the story going. Sign up for your free trial at audiobooks.com slash podcast free today. Because for podcast lovers like you, the end of an episode is just the beginning. That's audiobooks.com slash podcast F-R-E-E.